Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu. Let's get you straight to the biggest stories right now in the more than $13 trillion global ETF industry. Stocks are building on their recent recovery, gaining momentum as traders await a big week of economic data that will shape the Fed's next steps. We'll speak with Bill Miller IV, the son of legendary investor Bill Miller, on where he's finding value in the middle of this volatility. And it turns out Kathy Wood went on a tech buying spree during last week's market meltdown as ARK K sank to a new low for 2024. Now, before we get to all of that, ETF guru Eric Baltrinas from Bloomberg Intelligence is here and he is looking at flows as always. Eric, what do you see? Scarlett, thank you very much. So we had uh, a big uh, shock in the market last Monday. So that's going to be something we're going to see in the flows a little bit, but not bad. So at the top, you have VOO. This is a good sign. The Vanguard bid is relentless, and it is still relentless, regardless of what happened last week. Three billion, by the way, this ticker has taken in $57 billion this year. The annual record is 50 billion, so it's seven billion beyond the all-time record, and we're still in the summer. Just the boss right there. And you got Schwab in here, you've got VTI. Now, Bill is interesting, some people hiding out uh, in some treasuries. Treasuries actually went up last week. That was nice, because stock's going down. And some tech, so a little bit of tech buying there. But generally speaking, if we look at the outflows, you'll see that the trading crowd did, did leave the market a bit. SPY, IWM, HYG, EEM, these are all very old liquid ETFs used by traders predominantly. And so when you see outflows there, it tells you that the traders were a little spooked. My guess is they're taking a quick break. For the past couple months, traders and retail were both in together. But the traders left, retail still there. I want to focus on IWM, though. IWM is interesting. You know, small caps... You know, they have these comebacks, I don't know, like once every 18 months or so. And you can see it here. They're just kind of going along and then boom, they really took off about, this is a, about a month ago. And they had about two weeks. <laughs> That's all it lasted this time. We were, I was skeptical, but I was like trying to give them a chance. They took in all this money and then bam, right back down. And look at the outflows here. This is from IWM. IWM again, this is the trading crowd just getting out of small cap scarlet. So uh, you once again, you know, small caps get going for a little bit. This time it was only two weeks, though. It did last for two weeks, though, longer than uh, we had seen in a while. Eric, thank you so much. Joining our conversation right now is James St. Aubin. He is CIO at Ocean Park Asset Management. James, it is good to speak with you. I want to pick up where Eric left off, which is this idea that traders left, but retail is still there. Is that what you're seeing right now, despite the uh, underperformance once again of small caps? I think so. I think the traders got spooked. The, it's interesting that usually retail gets spooked by the volatility. This time it seemed to be the institutional community unwinding some positions. You know, you get the bar shock and they have to readjust positioning to account for that. So I think that does explain a lot of what's happened here. It's been interesting to see specifically, as you're talking about in small caps, how small caps have sort of uh, kind of had a false rally there for a little bit. And, it's, and I think that kind of has to do with the fact that the economy question uh, is still cir circulating about whether or not we're having a, a sort of a strong, strong enough economy. What we were talking about is is bad bad news, good news for certain stocks, and bad news is good news sometimes until it's not. And I think we're starting to see that that shift over to the side of where maybe there are some questions about recession. Mm -hmm. And when you start to hear that word, it's not a great small caps are not a great place to be. So I think that that explains some of that uh, reaction. So this is a dilemma that's been going on for a while now. I'm looking at one of your ETFs, uh, which is the ticker is DUKQ. And this is domestic ETFs you invest in. You've got a lot in the S&P 500, but you own the equal weight and, and mid caps, which again is going to be a slight value tilt uh, and a slight small tilt. Um, do you stick with that after what we just talked about or do you go more into the S&P and the MAG7? So yeah, we've been we've been you know the, we our ETFs are a month old. Uh, we started fully invested. Our ETFs have the ability to broaden out, uh, and in the sell-off, we did have some exposure to QQQM uh, and some other funds, momentum funds that uh, that showed us sell signal. So we saw downtrends there, and we exited those positions and entered the S and P 500. Um, so we still see positive trends in the broad market, the S and P 500, even though we have had a pullback. Our our downtrend signals have not um, have not been triggered, so we we maintained a fully invested posture, but we did have to move uh, move some uh, positioning around as as our uh, signals dictated. 
What were you doing on Monday, by the way? I'm just curious uh, how you were looking at the market action, the price action, and how you were either taking advantage of it or saying, you know, I'm going to steer clear and see uh, how things settle down first. Yeah, well, we had to react to the price. Price action drives our positioning. Uh, we're unemotional. We don't try to predict uh, what the next move is going to be. Clearly, the, the big uh, losers in, in this sell-off were the tech names, uh, the momentum names, big reversal there. That sent off a, a, bit, a signal to us that we needed to exit those positions and go into other areas of the market that were maintaining their uptrend. So that has, uh, that's essentially where we are at, we're at right now. We think that you know, it's certainly possible that the uh, large cap names can regain some leadership here, but I think there's some big questions about you know, one of the reasons I think that the market was selling off uh, was the fact that there is some questions about the uh, profitability of these AI names and the CapEx that's being uh, required to build that business. So well, it could be a rotation in leadership from sectors that have been like technology that have been outperforming. And of course, that's you know very concentrated exposure in something like the uh, NASDAQ to something more broad, which I think is a healthy thing, frankly. I think it's good to see other parts of the uh, other sectors of the index performing well. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But right now it was a, it was a signal to us that, you know, there could be more right. to come. Yeah. And one of your funds has uh, high income bond ETFs like, eight, you know, uh, high yield debt, eight, USHY, BKLN, HYD. Uh, so those are risky bonds. You saw on the chart I showed earlier that HYG was seeing some outflows. Um, what's your take on that? I mean, um, what do you do in the bond space? Do you take on risk now, given what you just said about tech, or um, do you pull back and maybe go to treasuries? Yeah, well, in our high income fund, we've maintained a fully invested posture. We didn't see enough price decline to trigger any uh, sell signals for us, so we're maintaining our exposure there in high yield bonds. You know, I, I, obviously, spreads did widen out a bit in reaction to uh, the market turmoil, which was uh, you know natural, but it, they didn't widen out quite enough to to generate uh, a downtrend signal for us. And that's why we've maintained our exposure. Um, you know, th this seems to be sort of a fleeting type of sell-off right now, at least the market action that we've seen since last Monday has been in sort of a recovery mode. And if that continues, I think that will maintain these, uh, maintain this positioning of, of high yield, uh, still making high yield look attractive. You know, one thing I noticed, James, is that for both uh, Duck Q and Duck H, D-U-K-H, um, the tickers begin with the letters D-U-K. Explain how that's a theme across your investment philosophy. So that's sort of a play on words there. Obviously, we want to duck to get out of danger, so the duck, uh, ducking. So we're trying to play defense and uh, when, when we see danger ahead. And, and so ducking, the, the action of ducking and sort of on a, in a metaphorical sense from a portfolio perspective, we can sell our, our positions and, and go to cash. We can also go into other parts of the market that are still exhibiting strength. But the, the optionality for us to go to cash when necessary, when our, when our models dictate, is the reason we, you know, we use the DUK symbol for all of our uh, tickers. And I think that just speaks to, gives people a reminder of what, we, what we're intending to do, which is to mm. duck when there's danger ahead. Yeah, um, for both these ETFs, the goal is to provide total return and to limit exposure to downside risk. And I know you've talked openly about the curse of high expectations as a risk that is hiding in plain sight. I'm curious to get your take on how you think or whether you think that has changed after the Monday meltdown, uh, the global meltdown on Monday. I think it's getting more attention. Uh, I don't think it's, it may still be underappreciated. That's my concern. Uh, that it may still be we're having we still have high expectations for some of these stocks and that doesn't necessarily mean they will be missed but it is a risk to the market that i don't think you know given how much crowding we've seen especially in those uh, mag seven names and and alike uh, i think that certainly and given there's been some recovery there that we haven't necessarily absorbed all that uh, awareness of that risk mm -hmm. so we're still we're still concerned uh, about that all right, still a theme that you're looking at then, so continue uh, ducking, I guess, in the meantime. James St. Aubin of Ocean Park Asset Management, thank you so much for joining us today. Coming up on ETF IQ, Kathy Wood goes on a tech spree as RK sinks to a new low this year after the meltdown we saw last Monday. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu. It's time now for the ETF Brief, where we highlight stories and trends that caught our eye. There is currently little love for emerging markets. Looking at VWO, which is Vanguard's $75 billion EM fund, it is riding its longest streak of outflows since back in 2020. The fund saw net withdrawals for 10 straight days, with investors yanking a total of $2.12 billion during that time. It's not alone, though, because the iShares Emerging Markets Fund, EEM, also saw outflows during this time. Meantime, paying for protection. This is the price action of the Cambria Tail Risk ETF, an actively managed fund that aims to insure portfolios against extreme market crashes. It's been a laggard most of this year before stabilizing in July, right around when the S&P 500 peaked. Last Monday, when the S&P 500 fell 3%, Tail had its best day since March of 2020. And I want to end with ARK-K, Kathy Woods' flagship fund. Its high watermark was clearly 2020, that's all the green there, when the fund attracted a ton of inflows. But RK has struggled since then, and so far in 2024, the fund is on pace for its worst year of outflow since its inception a decade ago. So let's talk more about Kathy Wood and RK with Bloomberg's Vildana Heyrich. Vildana, always great to have you. You um, have been following Kathy Woods' every move since the pandemic, and ETFs, of course, are very different from mutual funds in that the holdings are updated daily. There's a transparency that you don't get with mutual funds. So you poured through RK's holdings and noticed that Kathy Woods was very active during the recent market meltdown. What'd you find? Yeah, she, she puts out everything that her funds are buying or selling on a daily basis. It's very public. The funds are actively managed. So a lot of people have interest in what she is buying, what she is offloading. And over the last couple of days, as we were seeing a sell-off, across the board, across a lot of different asset classes, but we were seeing huge sell-offs in some of the biggest tech names. She was actually scooping up shares of Amazon, for example. So that was of interest to a lot of people because Amazon is such a big name. She loves innovation. Her innovation fund was buying Amazon as well as some other uh, funds of hers. They were also scooping up Roku, AMD. So it was of a lot of interest. One thing I've noticed, so when it comes to Kathy, um, looking at what she buys and sells sometimes can be misleading because if Tesla goes up and she likes Tesla, she'll sell a little bit. That doesn't mean she's bare as Tesla. She's trying to maintain a weight. That's right. But the weighting of Tesla has gone from 8% to 14%, meaning she's definitely bullish, definitely doubling down. It seems like her future is kind of tied to Tesla at this point. Well, we know that she's a huge fan of Elon Musk's and of Tesla. It, I think the same story can be said of cryptocurrencies, for example. She's hugely bullish on Bitcoin. She does have a, a Bitcoin fund, a Bitcoin ETF as well. So I, I think no big surprise that she, I mean, she's always been a very big proponent of Elon Musk. I think it's interesting what you said about how she's trying to maintain certain weightings um, and how, therefore, how much can you really read into what she does in terms of buying and selling these specific companies during extreme market moves? I mean, can you glean her MO from that or you just have to rely on what she tells you? We kind of have to rely on just what the, the, the buys and the sells tell us because she, she'll come out from time to time and say, you know, I made this move because I'm a big fan of Tesla. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought, you know, the dip in XYZ. This time around, we haven't really heard why, she, for example, she bought Amazon. Mm -hmm. At first blush, it might seem like, okay, well, this is one of the Magnificent Seven. It's been around for forever, whereas her fund is aimed at innovation. But then you can tie it back to, you know, cloud infrastructure or, or any one of those themes to say, potentially, this is one of the reasons she was buying the dip. All right, Vildana, thank you so much. Vildana Heyrich of Bloomberg News covering cross assets for us. Still ahead, we're going to drill down into an ETF that invests in undervalued stocks with Bill Miller IV of Miller Value Partners. That's next. And also a reminder, you can listen to Eric and Joel Weber on Trillions, their podcast that covers the industry, although you might need to change the name soon, right, given the flows? Yeah. Tens of trillions? Yeah, that, good point. Tens of trillions. This is ETF IQ on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu. It is time for today's drill down where we focus on one ETF. Eric, hit it. Scarlett, today we're looking at MVP, MVPA, which is the Miller Value Partners Appreciation ETF. 
This is managed by Bill Miller IV, son of uh, Bill Miller III, who uh, crushed it in the 90s and 2000s, beat the S&P, I believe, for 15 years straight. Uh, so this is like that style of value investing, looks for undervalued companies, uh, very concentrated, only, I think, 34 names in here. Actively managed, came out this year, 60 basis points, already 51 million. Um, that's not a ton, but for an active fund that just came out, that's, that's a good amount of money, I think, and you'll, you'll see why I probably got that in a minute. Let's look at the holdings here. So you're going to look at the holdings. Um, these are some stocks you probably know or don't know. One to point out, MicroStrategy. This has been a huge winner for this, although it has a high PE, although the overall fund PE is about 18. Uh, you've got AT&T, um, PayPal, some other ones you know of. You're going to be overweight industrials in this, overweight discretionary, and, and very underweight tech. Um, and again, the active share on this is 95%, meaning only 5% overlap of the S&P. Let's look at the holdings of the, I mean, the uh, return of this since it came out. And that's really what matters with active. And man, I, I got to say, I was, I was surprised at how much the outperformance has already happened in this. Usually it would take a, more than you know, half a year to double the S&P, right? So that's a really good sign and a really good start. You know, this is the value index and this is the S&P. This fund is up 22%. So if you're active and you're starting out, this is about as good of a start as you can hope for, Scarlett, hence the 50 million already. Yeah, good stuff. All right, Eric um, is gonna come back and join our conversation because right now, I'm pleased to say, is Bill Miller the fourth joining us now. He is CIO and portfolio manager at Miller Value Partners. Bill, it is good to speak with you. Uh, clearly, this is a value fund. You're sticking to the knitting of uh, the family name. Uh, you have a sizable allocation to tech, even if it is uh, less than the S&P 500's 31% weighting. You have about a 14% weighting uh, to internet names. I'm curious whether you cap um, your allocation to any single sector or is the fund so fundamentally driven that sector allocation is not really a driver here? It's more of an afterthought. Thanks, Scarlett. Uh, sector allocation kind of falls out of our bottoms up process. So we're looking systematically across the market for securities that we think have a higher prop have a high probability of outperforming the market over the next three to five years, call it. And we look at valuation primarily. And we look, uh, I'd say more than most managers at alignment. That's a major theme for us, not only in that we have a ton of our own assets in our own funds, but the largest investors in our funds. We also care immensely about whether or not management of the companies we buy own stock in their own firms that they run and whether or not they're acting in an aligned way. So if a manager is loading up on a stock, we're gonna be much more interested in it if they're buying it personally and it looks cheap than another stock that just looks cheap and there may be a bigger principal agent conflict, should we say. Um, I was looking at the holdings and the contribution to return. And as you know, MicroStrategy was a big chunk of that outperformance. Um, looking at their PE, it look, it's 207. Um, I guess when I opened up the holdings, I was, I was expecting to see just all value. Obviously that, for a lot of people, it would be like not a value stock, but do you see it as undervalued even at that valuation? Uh, well, so one of our main themes is flexibility, and that is also how we it comes uh, is with regard to how we define value. So, growth and new ideas and new concepts can be undervalued when you think about them on a larger scale. So, it's been our position for a long time. Uh, at least a decade that Bitcoin has been undervalued and remains undervalued as a concept in monetary technology. MicroStrategy was early to recognize that or at least uh, have the same view as us, the first publicly traded company to do so. And they announced they were putting it on their balance sheet four years ago. And so that got our attention. Um, at the same time, as a value related investor, the stock ran up a ton earlier this year at mm -hmm. the same time that the ETFs came out. So if you looked at the value of the stock relative to the value of its Bitcoin plus its software business, it was trading at its biggest premium ever to that at the same time that investors had a wider array of options in the, in the publicly traded market to get Bitcoin exposure with the new ETFs. So we thought that was a little bit large. It ran up to almost 20, maybe even above 20 percent of the portfolio. And that was too big at the time. So we cut that back. Uh, we still own MicroStrategy. We still love it longer term. Mm -hmm. It was just too big at 21%. So we have a, a portfolio of aligned businesses and technologies at compelling valuations. And as they sort of uh, move around those value relative to their intrinsic value, yeah. we will adjust the weights. 
Got it, got it. You tend to hold anywhere between 20 to 40 stocks. At any given time, how long or short is your shopping list, your wish list of companies that you're looking to buy? We're doing research every day on companies. And as we get to a point where we can throw one out, we'll just throw it out and move on to the next one if it doesn't hit everything on our checklist. So we're looking at things all the time. And the more that the overall investment case aligns with things with uh, factors that we believe make it likely to outperform over the long run, the bigger it will get. And that changes over time relative valuation, relative to market dynamics and all sorts of other things. Um, I want to shift gears. You have another ETF, MVPL is the ticker. This is kind of an interesting concept. You either buy the S&P 500 ETF, right, 100% long, or you go to the 2X S&P 500 ETF, and the fund just rotates between the two. What are the signals that dictate that rotation? Yeah, it's actually entirely quantitatively derived. It's first principles derived in that if you think about leverage, you generally speaking want to be levered things that go up over the long term, as long as you can avoid uh, the risk of ruin. And so it's it's our goal to avoid massive drawdowns with um, systematic risk factors that we've done a lot of quantitative work on. Um, and so it's either one times or two times. If it triggered actually last week and went to one X, and now we're back two times long again. Um, I don't want to get too far into the factors. They have evolved slightly over time, mm -hmm. but the underlying principles upon which they're derived have not. We have actually another set of research that we're digging into right now that may add something to the IP, but uh, what we have right now I think is pretty compelling, which is why we decided to launch it. And just curious, 30 seconds, last Monday, just a really horrible day in the market. Did that, is that what triggered to go to 2X because the market got cheaper? Um, it had to do with our assessment of potential for a, a larger drawdown in the next uh, couple months or so. Um, and, and that's, again, that's all quantitatively derived. So uh, it, it's a probabilistic approach. It's certainly not perfect. Um, time will tell, though, whether or not it works. Right. OK, good stuff. Bill Miller of Miller Value Partners. Really enjoyed speaking with you. Come back again. And a quick programming note that we'll be back on August 26th. That is two weeks from today due to next week's special coverage of the DNC. That does it for Bloomberg ETF IQ. I'm Scarlett Fu, along with Eric Balchunas. This is Bloomberg.